This morning our scripture lesson comes from Matthew chapter 17, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 13. <coughs> After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, do not be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, do not tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word this morning. Now, Perhaps you have heard that there is a student-led revival going on at Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. Uh, Alexandria Presta, the editor of the school newspaper, said this, We've been in Hughes Auditorium for over 100 hours, now almost 300 hours, praying, crying, worshiping, and uniting the cause of God's love. These young people want to experience the presence of God. They want something more than what the world has to offer. And I think it's very important for us to recognize that this, this revival broke out at Asbury three days after the Grammy Awards were aired on Sunday. And students from other universities are coming to Asbury and participating in these worship services. And they're going back to their schools and revival is breaking out on those campuses as well. Lee University in Knoxville, Tennessee, of Sanford University in Birmingham, Cedarville University in Ohio. The revival is breaking out all across the, the, the South right now, but people are coming from all over the world, from Brazil and Africa and the Philippines, to be a part of what's happening in Wilmore, Kentucky. Now, during the first Great Awakening in America back in the 18th century, Jonathan Edwards said this, God made, has had it much on his heart from all eternity to glorify his dear and only begotten Son. And there are some special seasons that he appoints to that end, wherein he comes forth with omnipotent power. And these are times of remarkable pouring out of his Spirit to advance his kingdom. Revivals then, according to, to Edwards, are special times and seasons when God the Father reveals, glorifies, and exalts his Son through the power of his Holy Spirit. And he does it in such clear-cut and powerful ways that you can't miss it because he wants the whole world to know who his beloved son Jesus is. And let me tell you, the things that are happening in Asbury, the whole world is seeing because God wants it seen. God wants to see people coming before him and, and, and offering their confession and offering their prayers and, and falling on their knees and, and asking for forgiveness. These are things that God is doing in our world today, and he wants us to be a part of it. Edwards goes on to say that in revivals, people get seized, gripped, and overwhelmed by the divine excellency of Christ. As a result of being captured by his love, they fall in love and stay in love with Jesus in such a way that their lives are never the, change, never the same, the church is never the same, and the world is never the same. When we experience these divine encounters firsthand, they grip us so profoundly 
they transform and shape us so deeply that they set us on a trajectory that continues for the rest of our lives. Like Paul's encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road, these divine encounters impart to us such a profound awareness of his presence, such a, a revelation of the risen and exalted Christ, such an experience with his Holy Spirit, such an unswerving commitment to his mission that it caused Paul to declare years later while he was standing in chains before King Agrippa, no matter what happens to me, I simply cannot be disobedient to such a heavenly vision. In other words, Paul was saying, I don't care what you do to me, I will never deny the experience that I had with my Jesus on the Damascus Road. I think Jonathan Edwards has it right. We need revivals because we need more of Jesus in our lives today. Through revivals, God raises up a generation of people, a church, who are focused on Christ. Revivals produce Christians who are faithful and bold and unapologetic. Christians who find joy and satisfaction in God alone. Christians who have a passion for holiness. And revivals cause the church to move forward in purity and power and unity, in boldness and confidence to be his witnesses in this world. As a result, God's people are able to withstand the cultural pressures to conform and compromise. They refuse to be seduced by the world any longer. In Matthew 16, a few verses before our text for this morning, Jesus reminds his apostles and he reminds us that we need to be focused on the things of God. That our eternal souls are more important than anything that we can gain in this world. And Jesus tells the three disciples who will accompany him up, up the mountain that they will witness the coming of the kingdom of God. And then once on the mountain, the disciples see the glory of God's kingdom shining out of Jesus. And they hear the voice of God and immediately they fall to the ground terrified. But then Jesus touches them and says, do not be afraid. He, he speaks a word of peace into their lives. And on that mountain, they see the power of God. They see the power of the kingdom that is in Christ Jesus. And I believe Jesus wants to touch our lives and, and speak a word of peace into our lives today. So what can we learn from the disciples' experience? First, they saw the glory of God. Oh, to see the glory of God. To see the power of the kingdom that is Christ Jesus. In the transfiguration of Jesus, we see the glory of God in the face of Jesus. The Apostle John remembered it years later and he wrote, We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And Peter also wrote about it. We do not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. Jesus went up on the mountain to pray and he went with Peter, James, and John. And as he prayed, Jesus was transfigured his glory was revealed not only to, to these disciples, but to Moses and Elijah, and, and, and they, were, they were there witnessing to him and comforting him. In Matthew, we read and we've read, his face shone like the sun and his, his clothes became as white as the light. In Mark, it says, his clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach. And in Luke, it says, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as the flash of lightning. From one standpoint, the, the purpose of the transfiguration was to strengthen the heart of Jesus as he was praying about his approaching death and departure. What Jesus endured on the cross would be difficult even for him. But from a human perspective, we can't even begin to imagine the agony that Jesus went through when he carried our sins to Calvary. 
Jesus is then encouraged and comforted by the presence of Moses and Elijah and by the voice of his father. And the testimony of Scripture and the eyewitnesses make it clear that the glory seen on the mountain came from within him. Jesus radiated the glory of God. He became ablaze in divine glory. A unique change came over Jesus, and the disciples saw him undergo this unique transformation before their very eyes. It was an unusual radiance, even with his clothes becoming marvelous in appearance. And in that moment, Jesus was changed, and, and he took on the form of his heavenly glory. Now, from another standpoint, the transfiguration gave these three chosen disciples a glimpse of God's glory, a, a glimpse of heaven, a glimpse of the joy that was awaiting them. And it was a special event in which God allowed certain apostles to have a spiritual experience that was meant to strengthen their faith as they faced the challenges that they would have to face in the coming days. And then they saw a preview of Jesus' glorification as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The disciples never forgot what happened to them on that mountain, and how could they? And I can't imagine that any of the students that are going to these revival uh, services at Asbury are going to ever forget that moment when they were in the presence of God and they, and they were able to experience God's holy presence. Then these disciples heard God's voice from heaven saying, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. That's, a, that's three words you probably need to underline in your Bible. Listen to him. I believe God is, is saying to us, Be still and be quiet and listen to Jesus. I don't know about your mother, but my mother used to say that to us all the time. Be still, be quiet, and listen. And brother, when my mother Dean said that, all four of us boys, were we, she had our undivided attention. And I think God wants our undivided attention today. I think he wants us to start listening to him. But unfortunately, being still and listening is not something we do very well. We live in a world that's full of noises, full of distractions, and full of voices vying for our attention. But when we take the time to be still and know that he is God and listen to him, when we open ourselves to hear the voice of God, we begin to heed his guidance and learn how to live our lives in a way that brings glory to his holy name. In the same way, at certain times in this life, God may give certain believers, not all believers all the time, special experiences of his grace that strengthen our faith. I believe that's what we see happening in these days at these college campuses. Just like the disciples didn't want to leave and come down off that mountain, these students don't want to leave from the presence of God. And if you were there, you wouldn't want to leave either. Tammy and I have been watching online for the last week or so. And we've said to each other more than on one occasion, we need to go. We need to go. And there may come a time in the next couple of hours that I'm not in this state any longer. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to go when God says go. But we should welcome these experiences as the graces that they are. But we shouldn't expect them to continue indefinitely, nor should we be resentful when they cease. Because these are mountaintop experiences that God wants us to have to encourage us, to enable us to withstand the things that are coming our way. Now, I'm sure that some of you have had a mountaintop experience in your life. And when I've talked to people that have had mountaintop experiences in their life, I ask them, do you want another one? And everybody I've ever talked to said, yes, I want another one. Yes, I want to experience that again. I want to experience the presence of the living God in my life. Because these momentary mountaintop experiences are glimpses of the joy of heaven. Jesus will be, one day Jesus is going to be glorified in us and, and we shall so, show forth something of his beauty. Paul writes to the Thessalonians and he says this, on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. Paul says, this includes you. 
because you believed our testimony to you. You believe what God's word has said and does say, and one day you will share in his glory. But what do we do until then? How do we deal with the struggles that we face each and every day? Through his power. The power that was displayed on this mountaintop, the power that was displayed when God raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that we have access to today. Jesus has the power to change our hearts. Think about how many times Peter messed up. I mean, there's some of us that have probably messed up more than Peter, but probably not many of us. You know, Peter messed up at every turn. On one occasion, you know, John in his gospel says that Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. And I'm sure Malchus appreciated that, you know? And it's lucky that Jesus was there because he put the ear back on and healed Malchus. And, but then Peter denies Christ three times in one evening, probably thinking he would never see Jesus again. He decides to go fishing with some of his buddies, and he's out all night long and didn't catch anything. And then the next morning, some shadowy figure standing next to a fire on the beach says, throw your net on the right side of the boat. And I'm sure Peter was like, I'm a professional fisherman. I know how to fish. But they throw the net on the right side of the boat and they catch so many fish they can't hardly haul them in. But then that's when John says, it's the Lord. And what does Peter do? He drops everything and swims 100 yards to shore just to fall down at the feet of Jesus so that he could be reconciled with the Lord. He wanted a second chance. And when Jesus calls to us, we need to run to him and fall to our knees and, 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 and just like Peter did because we want a second chance just like Peter received. And maybe you're saying this morning, I don't deserve a second chance. Well, folks, you didn't deserve the first one. That's why it's called grace and God is a God of second chances. And he wants to give you a second chance this morning. And he wants to give me a second chance this morning. I can't, even, I can't even begin to tell you how many times I went to the altar between the age of about 10 and 18. Every time my dad had an altar call, I went down there and I had to confess something else. <laughs> but he is a God of second chances. And Jesus also has the power to give us a right spirit. You know, you don't get a nickname like Sons of Thunder for no reason. James and John had that nickname. They were bold brothers, amazing guys, colorful characters, and they wouldn't back down from any confrontation. In fact, they probably were looking for one because on one occasion when the people in the village of Samaria were not responsive to the message of Jesus, it was James and John who wanted to call down fire from heaven and destroy that village. But God transformed them. And at the end of their lives, these men who were known as the sons of thunder became known for something else. James was the inner part of the inner circle of Jesus. And he was a prominent leader in the fellowship of believers in Jerusalem. And John became the apostle of love. God made James and John into different people, and he could do the same for us. We don't have to live with that old man any longer or that old woman any longer. He can create in us a new heart and a right spirit he can create in us that new person that can worship him in spirit and in truth, that can live for him, for his glory. And then Jesus has the power to get us involved in mission, in his mission. Think about the lives that were changed by the, the, by the disciples. If you read the book of Acts, all throughout the book of Acts, it says that, that, that it describes how thousands of people, how their lives were changed by the disciples. And what about the years that, that, that followed? Over 2,000 years of Christianity and down through the ages, God has continued to change lives. He changed my life. He's changed your life. And he wants to change everyone's life that hasn't turned to him as Lord and Savior. Now think about the students at Asbury University, at Lee University, at Sanford University, at Cedarville University, and all those students. He's wanting to change their lives. And all the people that are coming from all over the world, from Brazil, from Africa, from Europe, from the Philippines, they're coming from all over the world to experience the presence of the living God. 
and he wants to change their lives as well. Tim Tennant, the president of Asbury Theological Seminary, said this after going a couple of nights in a row to this revival. He says, you sense the presence and power of God working in people's lives. These embers have been fanned into flame, and there is, a, there is clearly a definite move of God to reveal himself and to call a new generation to faithfulness at a time when we most needed it. There comes a point when the people of God become tired of casual prayers and move to a point of desperation which opens us up in fresh ways to God's surprising work. We serve a surprising God. He's never surprised by anything that happens to us, but he surprises us all the time. And he's surprising the world right now because all these media outlets want to go up there and explain it away. Tell me who can explain who God is. Not anybody I've seen on the TV. All we can do is just experience God moving without trying to explain it and simply receive what he has to offer us. When Jesus spoke about the Spirit of God, he said the wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. And I believe that God wants us to be a part of what he is doing in this world today. He can use you, he can use us to make a difference in this world if we will listen to him, if we will let his spirit witness to our spirit. You remember the prayer that King David prayed in, in Psalm 51? He said this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. And you can pray that prayer this morning, and I believe with all my heart that God will do exactly that. He'll create in you a clean heart and, and give you a right spirit. Or you can fall down on your knees this morning and cry to God, I need a second chance. Listen, Jesus needed to be encouraged, so he went up on the mountain to pray, and that prayer experience brought the glory of God down from heaven. It changed the disciples forever, and we too can experience awesome changes in our life if we will be still and listen and pray. And the voice of the Father was reassuring and refreshing to Jesus and the disciples. Listen to that still, small voice of God and allow the Spirit of God to pour into your spirit His grace and His mercy. It's the secret of a fruitful life and the joy of the soul. So here's my question to you. What is God saying to you today? Only you can answer that question. What's God saying to you? This is what Isaiah reminds us of. Whether you turn to the right or the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Are you listening? Are you walking in the way? And Jesus sends us out. See, because it doesn't stop right now. It don't stop at 11 o'clock. Because Jesus sends us out to live transformed lives before the world. The Bible tells us, but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as with the Spirit of the Lord. Men who live in darkness can see a reflection of God dwelling in every transformed believer. They see the glory of God in us. And even now, as we behold him, we are being transformed from glory unto glory. I love what D.L. Moody said about revivals. He said this, every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. And as we pray for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done, as we yearn for God's presence in our life, God will begin to move among us as, as we are willing and praying and listening and broken and confessing people, God offers living water to all of us if we will drink from his cup. This movement of God's spirit is an opportunity where we can experience the outpouring 
of the Holy Spirit and experience a time of refreshing. What's happening in Asbury and around the world is God reaching out to us, God reaching out to his people, and God revealing himself and calling us to Christ and saying, listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. Are you listening? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are a God who cares about us, who is reaching out to us, who is calling us unto himself. And Lord, we pray that that we will begin to experience your presence in our life in such marvelous ways that we won't be able to explain it, that no one will be able to explain it away. Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you so much for loving us. And we pray, Lord, this morning that as we continue to search for ways to get closer to you, as we continue to yield our lives, as we continue to get on our knees and pray and ask for forgiveness, as we continue to to invite your, your living presence into our lives. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you will meet us here. That we will experience an, a, an overflow of your Holy Spirit in our life. That we will have a fresh encounter with you. And that we will experience your grace and mercy in new ways. And Lord, we just thank you for your love. And we thank you for your presence in our life. And we pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. This morning you have an opportunity to ask the Lord to, to change your life, to ask the Lord to come into your life, to ask the Lord to, to do a new work in your life, and he will if you'll ask him.